Coach Johnson, your uh, team has a knack for coming to the White House. The decade is not even half over, and they've already won two Super Bowls. There's no telling what this team can do. 1994 began with the Cowboys <laughs> winning their second straight Super Bowl. Surprisingly, a few weeks later, America's team made headlines again. We have mutually decided that I would no longer be the head football coach with the Dallas Cowboys. The drama in Big D wasn't the only thing keeping the NFL in the news. Growing interest in the scouting combine took hold in February. Free agency in only its second year made March the NFL's hot stove month. The Cincinnati Bengals have the first selection. And April, of course, belonged to the draft, where in 1994, first round trades and first rate fireworks elevated the mundane to must-see TV. That's why the Colts are the laughing stock of the league year in and year out. This was the dawn of the NFL as a year-round sport. The National Football League selection meeting is now in second. Pittsburgh selects Lynn Swan. Little Boomer. I mean, is he going to go in the first round at all? That's why the Colts are picking second every year. Who in the hell is Mel Kiper? Chargers select Eli Manning. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Back to the, the 1994 draft was a benchmark for the NFL's modern era. One team had to dump a defensive starter on the eve of the draft in order to fit under the league's new salary cap. San Francisco 49ers needed to make some room or they would not even be able to participate in the draft today. It had a new seven-round format, which led to one of the most upside-down drafts in history. Several late finds would help four different teams reach the Super Bowl. The St. Louis Rams are the world champions. And it ushered in a new oh, era oh. of trade inspired by Jerry Jones and Jimmy Johnson, the men who remade America's team. They had made the big trade with Herschel Walker, where they had traded Herschel Walker to Minnesota for just a boatload of draft picks, which for the most part they used very wisely. And they end up with nine NFL starters out of the 91-92 drafts. Russell Maryland with the first pick. They draft Elvin Harper. They draft Dixon Edwards. They pick up Eric Williams, Leon Lett, Larry Brown. In 92, they draft Kevin Smith, Robert Jones. And if that wasn't enough, then they pick up some guy named Derrick Woodson. So nine guys in two drafts sort of fast forward this organization from one in 15 to winning three Super Bowls in four years. <laughs> Jimmy, Jerry, both of them were huge gamblers and they traded like crazy. My five years in Dallas, we made 51 trades more than the rest of the league put together. This freewheeling approach was backed by a mathematical tool of their own design, the draft pick value chart. I never ever felt like this old take the best player available was what I wanted to do. I wanted to take the player that I wanted. And if that pick was too high, I wanted to trade down to a position where he should be picked. I go to Jerry and I said, I think there's a better way to do it. So Jerry's buddy, they were in the oil business together. His name was Mike McCoy. And he studied the past drafts. Mike basically took the trades that had been made for years and put a quantitative value on them so that you could fundamentally say the fifth pick in the third round requires what to go with it to get up in the second round. Well, is there anything, any consideration? Soon, the chart became as ubiquitous in NFL circles as the periodic table in the classroom. Everybody would refer to it before a trade was made. We would talk about, is this fair? What do you think of this trade? Here's what they're offering. And then somebody would say, what does the chart say? Well, obviously, we'd switch places and we would want uh, two twos. That chart was well received because we all, in trades, want to be sure that we don't get stiffed. To switch first with them, all he wants is our first, second, third, and something else. I said, how about my daughter? We'll throw her in. And uh, the chart's been changed a hundred times, salary cap, on and on, but it still gives you a quick look as far as making trades pick for pick. Jerry and Jimmy, to me, they changed the whole dynamic. They took it from this sleepy little meeting to this live poker game. While the Cowboys revolutionized the draft process, ESPN made innovations to the draft broadcast. 
They added former players like Joe Theismann, remote reporters with the latest scoop, and fly-on-the-wall cameras in certain war rooms, including the Dallas Cowboys. Moments ago on the Dallas Cowboy uh, war room camera, Jerry Jones was working the phones and ended up uh, hanging up on uh, one of the telephone calls looking uh, rather upset. It provided great visuals for us. It did, for the first time, kind of take the viewer inside you know, one of the clubs. I mean, I think that's kind of the secret of television, take people where they normally can't go. And I remember Jerry Jones just being a guy, unlike any owner I had ever seen, like just out front all the time and not shy. The fallout with Johnson made for a new dynamic in Dallas, entering the 94 draft. It was Jerry's world now. Jones tried to wheel and deal his way high enough to take defensive end Willie McGinnis, but the chart, made popular by the Cowboys, now seemed to work against them. Yeah, we tried like uh, everything in the world to get up to get Willie, and we couldn't come up with enough draft choices or point spread, and Jerry was sick about it. And the Cowboy reaction in the war room was uh, less than popular when New England made the choice of the player that they were trying to trade up to get. No word on if they'll move up for another defensive player. You know that you have an opportunity to trade up and down the draft, and we were going to trade Alvin Harper for one guy, and that was Willie McGinnis and no one else. With the 23rd pick in the first round, Dallas has selected Shante Carver, defensive end from Arizona State. The Cowboys salvaged their draft in the second round with the selection of Larry Allen, a future Hall of Famer. But the Carver pick was the first of many draft misses that would haunt the team for years to come. It ain't like we all quit after Jimmy walked out. You know, everybody in this league would give anything in the world to be in the championship game and in the Super Bowl the next year, and we were. And sure, it was with Jimmy's team, but we didn't screw it up. Fifteen years of the NFL Draft here on ESPN. Boy, time flies when you're having fun. Lots of changes over the past decade and a half, from Billy Sims to Drew Bledsoe. The time has changed, the length has changed, but one thing hasn't changed. We're here, we're there, we're everywhere. By 1994, the NFL Draft had made it big. Now held in Times Square, ESPN's telecast was a television spectacle. It was a pretty big event. It was huge, and uh, it really started to grow. And the, the numbers, the ratings, all the preview shows and the like, the coverage that it had on SportsCenter, uh, everything was, uh, was elevated. The NFL offseason had grown in popularity as well. Draft Knicks now took an interest in the data coming out of the scouting combine in February. The popularity of it kind of caught me off guard because, you know, we'd go there and we'd sit for hours and hours and hours and hours. Sometimes it felt like you're watching, you know, paint peeling, but uh, apparently people love it. The poster child for this modern obsession with combine data was Dan Big Daddy Wilkinson, the consensus number one overall pick. We think we know who the first pick is. Young man named Dan Wilkinson, defensive tackle extraordinaire from Ohio State. I saw this mammoth person sprinting effortlessly up and down the field, leading the pack, and naturally said, who is this guy? He looked like a man among boys. A big six foot four and a quarter, 313 pounder, ran that 472, 32 reps at 225, awesome weight room strength. He set some uh, combine numbers that were ridiculous. It was almost like Superman. And for whatever reason, people decided that Dan Wilkinson is going to be the next Reggie White. He's about as high a rated defensive lineman as you've seen, is that correct? I really think, Chris, he's one of the top three defensive linemen in the last decade, up there with Reggie White and Cortez Kennedy. And the point is, there isn't going to be another Reggie White. There are big bucks ahead for Ohio State sophomore Dan Big Daddy Wilkinson. The Cincinnati Bengals made the 315-pound defensive tackle the top pick in today's NFL draft. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very, you know, glad that Cincinnati chose me as number one pick. And uh, basically, I'm ready to, you know, get in camp as soon as possible and strap it up. You know, the knock on Dan was in the big games, he'd show up and flash and play brilliantly. And then against Purdue, when the game to me, he kind of just, like, disappeared. Was he a guy that had the will, desire, motor to be a dominant player every single snap. And talking to 
high school coaches that he played against up in Dayton. That was the knock on him in high school. There were always glimpses of the talent and the greatness, but it was never sustained. He would break your heart. You'd watch a game and go, there he is, there's Big Daddy. And then the next game or the next couple of games, he would disappear. Big Daddy certainly wasn't the next Reggie White, but he did play for 13 years in the NFL. He was a very serviceable NFL defensive lineman who lasted for more than a decade. There's no shame in that. But when you are selected number one, there is a burden of expectation that comes with that, and he never quite lived up to that standard. Including Wilkinson, six of the first 13 picks in the 1994 draft were defensive linemen, a record at the time. While the Bengals were rebuilding, the Kansas City Chiefs were looking for a few final pieces to add to a contender. Modern free agency began in 1993, causing a shift in how NFL teams built their rosters. It changed how you looked at the draft. This was a great way to fill in some of the holes on your roster with some veteran players. The Chiefs filled a hole with future Hall of Famer Marcus Allen. Allen joined 1993 trade acquisition Joe Montana to lead Kansas City to the AFC title game, where they lost to the Bills. In the 1994 draft, the Chiefs needed to add offense, and the internal debate of their war room was captured in never-before-seen footage. Now, the draft is actually happening in New York City, and we're on the phone right here talking with them, and as the draft goes on, they communicate. It's an open line. With their first selection, the Chiefs knew they wanted a running back, but the room was divided over who to take. Florida State's William Floyd, Texas A&M's Greg Hill, or Arizona State's Mario Bates. Who you want in that group? 25th pick, Greg Hill. On the clock now, the Kansas City Chiefs, who came so close, who got to the AFC title game last year. Bill? We have five minutes, five minutes remaining Chiefs with our selection. We're at Hill and Bates. And um, I prefer Hill. He gave, he gave this guy a better grade than he gave Greg. So we've got to make a decision here. OK, we got three minutes and 40 seconds right now. Is there any questions at all about this guy's character? <clears throat> Two minutes and 30 seconds. Any questions about Mario Bates' knee? No. We're fine. OK. Texas Because Greg Hill is what he is, a tough SOB and a good football player. And I'm not so sure about the other guy, but I don't know the other guy. We've got Mario Bates from Arizona State, William Floyd from Florida State, and Greg Hill from Texas A&M, all three of running backs. I will just say this, if Mario Bates had got hurt, we wouldn't be talking. Bill, we have one minute and 30 seconds remaining. You there, Bill? Yeah, okay. I'd say, yeah. Let me talk to you. All right. Mm -hmm. You go along with either one. Right. But there's one deciding factor. This guy's got to coach Right. We got 30 seconds, Bill. Whatever you want to do, I want. I think Craig kills the play. I mean, I, Jimmy said the only cons the only difference in him was the size. All right. One second. Be excited with Greg Hill. Yeah. Okay. Greg Hill. Greg Hill. Greg Hill. Greg Hill. Greg Hill. I'm turning in Greg Hill, running back from Texas A&M. It's going up. The card is on its way to the commissioner, and you know what that means. We're all going to find out. With the uh, 25th pick in the first round, Kansas City selects Greg Hill, running back, Texas A&M. All right. Hey, got another number one pick. It always gets down to a final decision. I, I had that responsibility with the Chiefs. As a general manager, you're trying to give your head coach the players that fit his personality. All right. Hopefully you make a good gut decision. <laughs> the Chiefs spent their first four picks on offensive skill players in 1994. Three out of the four were gone from Kansas City in four years. The 94 season ended with a first round loss in Miami and Joe Montana's retirement. Mario Bates and Greg Hill 
both turned in average NFL careers, each rushing for just over 3,000 yards. It's the 59th annual selection meeting, as they call it in the NFL. And as the rules change and the brave new world of the salary cap and teams and free agency, perhaps more than ever before, a premium on the seven rounds of the NFL draft. I mean, so many things were going on in 94 that really hadn't been seen before. You had underclassmen being drafted in fairly significant numbers. You had free agency begin to have an effect on how teams filled needs. And you had all these mock drafts taking interest in the draft to a greater degree than ever before. Mel Kuyper is doing his, and Dr. Zeopold Zimmerman is doing his. No matter how many more hours these teams have spent having access to info and medicals and stuff that none of us have, we all think that we can do it as good as they do. Well, Chris, this is a pick that I had. I had McGinnis going uh, number four to New England. Really, I thought it because he is an impact player. Sorry, Mel, the Rams now on the board. Now let's take a look at yours. Where should they be looking for value? Well, that position. Mel Kuyper has built a career for himself as the outsider with inside knowledge, the first great armchair GM. He has published his own draft guide every spring since 1981, complete with write-ups on each pro prospect. I'm always interested to read his book as long as he sends it free. <laughs> By 1994, Kuiper and his big board were fixtures of the broadcast. There was little debate as to who would go number one, but intrigue surrounded the landing spots for Heath Schuler and Trent Dilfer, the top two quarterback prospects. The Indianapolis Colts are now on the clock. Now they have two very high first round picks, the number two pick right now, and the number seven pick overall. With the um Second pick in the first round, the Indianapolis Colts select Marshall Falk, running back, San Diego State. He's a great back, but I strongly disagree with this pick, and it's not any criticism of Marshall Falk. The Colts have to come out of this draft with a quarterback, and if they don't, they're right for some criticism. Kuyper, he had been building up two weeks prior to the draft about having to take a quarterback, and I was the opinion that uh, I was running the Colts and not uh, anybody on a network. Bill Tobin took the future Hall of Famer. He had acquired the Colts' other top 10 pick by trading Jeff George to the Falcons, leaving free agent signee Jim Harbaugh as the only quarterback on the roster, the same Harbaugh that Tobin drafted eight years earlier as GM of the Chicago Bears. Walter Payton and Jim Harbaugh are the two most competitive players I've ever been around in my life, and he was going to be my quarterback. I wasn't interested in Trent Dilfer and Heath Schuler. We didn't have either one of them in our top 10 players. With the uh, third pick of the first round, the Washington Redskins select Heath Schuler, quarterback, Tennessee. New England Patriots select Willie McGinnis, linebacker, USC. Trent Dilfer is falling. <laughs> Can you believe that? I don't know what he's saying. Was Santa Claus waiting on him ever this exciting? I don't know, man. This is amazing, huh? I get a big kick out of every year. I have that ugly green suit on and a big flock of seagulls hairdo. So that's, uh, that's why I like it being reruns. People actually believe I had hair at one point. So you are surprised? Oh, very surprised. Yeah, I, we thought for sure it would be either Indianapolis, Washington, or L.A. Uh, the next logical choice was the Indianapolis Colts. The Colts traded up with the Rams, moving from number seven to number five. Everyone thought they were moving up to take Dilfer. What followed became the signature moment of the 1994 draft. The Rams have made a trade with uh, Indianapolis, and Indianapolis has selected uh, Trev Alberts, linebacker from Nebraska. Wow. And that's simple. Well, I mean, Albert's a great player. Yeah. There's typical. no question about that, but you got a problem with this move? I think it's a typical Colt move. I mean, here's a team that needed a franchise quarterback to pass up a Trent Dilfer when all you have is Jim Harbaugh. Give me a break. That's why the Colts are picking second every year in the draft, not battling for the Super Bowl like other clubs in the National Football League. It was, whoa, Mel, where are you going, Vase? You know, mild man and Mel, all of a sudden, boom, here he comes. That's why the Colts are picking second every year in the draft. <laughs> you know, Mel was never shy in his opinion, and he wasn't shy in his opinion in this case. Well, you think about Jim Harbaugh was a solid quarterback. 
not a great one. And you felt like, okay, can these quarterbacks improve your position? And I thought Trent Dilfer could. And obviously, general managers don't like to be called out like that by analysts. So shortly afterward, we kick it down to Indianapolis where Chris Mortensen is with Bill Tobin. Uh, I knew you'd have one surprise for us today. <laughs> not, a, not a surprise to us. No, that's great. I mean, no, that's what I mean. I'm not, I'm not, hey. One question, Bill. A lot of criticism about not taking a quarterback here. Your response? Well, you know, we got a guy up there. Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper in a way? I mean, here's a guy that criticizes everybody, whoever they take. He's got the answers to uh, who you should take and who you shouldn't take. In my knowledge of him, he's never ever put on a jock strap. He's never been a coach. He's never been a scout. He's never been an administrator. And all of a sudden, he's an expert. He's in our papers two days ago telling us who we have to take. We don't have to take anybody that Mel Kuyper says we have to take. Mel Kuyper has no more credentials to do what he's doing than my neighbor, and my neighbor's a postman, and he doesn't even have season tickets to the NFL. At that instant just became clear that this was reality television of the highest order. Oh, I think I probably got my Irish up. Bill Tobin was a hot-headed guy. I love Bill. He said what the entire league thought. Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper, in a way? <laughs> I know I and probably 27 other general managers congratulated him. Uh, it, it was classic. Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper? Mel Kuyper doesn't know any more than my postman. The thing is, nobody's ever really tracked down Tobin's mailman to, to find out exactly how much he does. I'd like to know that sometime. It could be that Tobin's mailman knows a lot about football. It might have been more of a compliment than any of us realized. Mel Kuyper? <laughs> well, Mel Tobin, obviously, not going out to dinner tonight. Well, Chris, I'll tell you, I'm secure in my position. Obviously, Bill Tobin is not very secure in his position to have a response like that. I didn't take exception to the comments. Bill Tobin was entitled to his opinion. He was critical of what I said, so be it. I wasn't there to show for the NFL. I was there to give an opinion, and I've always done that. To me, it's a mistake. You cannot go with Jim Harbaugh and pass up Trent Dilfer. Forget it. That's why the Colts are the laughing stock of the league year in and year out. April 24th, 1994, a day that will live in infamy. Kuyper, Tobin, and Tobin's postman became the talk of the draft. What do you want to cover first, our players or uh, that, that or that jerk in uh, Baltimore? You know, of all the things my whole career, that might be the one that people want to talk about the most. It was obviously an entertaining, very entertaining for the fans, and uh, it's still being talked about today. Mel, you know, is probably the single biggest person in terms of why the draft has been popular on ESPN. So we didn't have any problem with it. You know, controversy is good on television, and we will win regardless of what Mel Kuyper said. In the aftermath, Jim Harbaugh led the Colts to the AFC Championship game in 1995. Marshall Falk is in the Hall of Fame. Trev Alberts was out of the league in just three years. Bill Tobin was fired in 1997 after the Colts went 3-13. and 13. Well, first of all, it's been a great experience for me. Not just me, but everybody who came. We had fun. Um, it's first class. It, they really treat you nice up here. 1994 was the second year the NFL showcased multiple players live at the draft. Our next guest is a three-time All-American running back, a public administration major from New Orleans, Louisiana. Please welcome Marshall Falk. I always tell people about that moment, and, and I love going back to the draft because it takes me back, and it brings me back to that moment. Fresno State quarterback Trent Dilfer's moment involves some behind-the-scenes drama. My situation got a little tipsy-turvy there. We really thought through the whole process we were going to the Redskins. The Washington Redskins select Heath Schuler, quarterback, Tennessee. So you are surprised? Oh, very surprised. But hey, I mean, shows how much we know and how, how much everybody else knows. I spent a ton of time with the Redskins. Obviously, must not have done very well in the tests. <laughs> the Redskins' change of heart came not with a test, but with the hire of head coach Norv Turner. At the end of the regular season, we had Trent Dilfer rated ahead of Heath Schuller. We thought he was more of what we had been used to with the Redskins, big, strong arm guy. With the change in coaches, mobility became a big issue. So that's where Schuller kind of jumped up in the process. The next logical choice was the Indianapolis Colts. Add context to the Mel Kuyper argument with Tobin. We had manipulated the draft. 
and let the Colts know that I wouldn't play for them. We had the leverage of the next year was expansion, and I would have been the first pick the next year. I was very serious that I was willing to sit out an entire year and then go into expansion. Your legs are moving a little bit. You nervous right now? I'm a little nervous, yeah, I am. All right, boom, we'll see here in just a minute. Which then kind of by default, I then knew I was going to Tampa. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have uh, made the sixth pick in the first round, and they've selected Trent Dilfer, quarterback, Fresno State. Well, they took their time, the didn't they? But the Rams Buccaneers have gotten the their block. man, Trent Dilfer. I have deep regrets that we did that. I think that is horrible. My wife to this day <laughs> gets mad at me for doing it. Uh, the, the chance to play with Marshall Falk for 10 years, I think, that, think my career might have been a little bit different. But it's how things go. You don't seem very excited, Andy. Oh, I'm very I, surprised, but I, I'm, I'm fired up. I really am fired up. I mean, this is a perfect situation. You didn't go to a couple teams. Yeah, it does not matter when you're drafted. It's who you're drafted by. Dilfer got his wish. After six underwhelming years as a Buccaneer, he signed with the Ravens in 2000, where, aided by one of the NFL's all-time great defenses, he won a Super Bowl in Tampa Bay's Raymond James Stadium. And what a pass, Dilfer threw right down the middle. He had to throw one here in Tampa Bay ever like that. That pass is gorgeous. Three picks before Dilfer, Washington selected Heath Schuler, the quarterback many thought was a can't-miss prospect. Chris, I think Norv Turner's got his Troy Aikman, and it's going to be Heath Schuler. Personally, I thought Heath Schuler had first-round ability, but wasn't a top pick. But what happens is you can talk yourself into, we have to get a quarterback. If we don't take one here, we won't get one. The irony for the Redskins was that they did find a quarterback in the seventh round of the same draft in Gus Farratt. While Schuler was plagued with injuries and struggled, Farrat won over the hometown crowd by outperforming his first round counterpart. Issue one, Gus Farrat. How successful will Gus Farrat be? John, if Heath Schuler's performance last week is any measure, which is absolute zero, this guy can't get less than a five. I went into Coach Turner, I said, Coach, why do these people hate me so much? You know, it emotionally affected me because I'd never had people dislike me ever in my life. Schuler won only four games in 13 starts while throwing twice as many interceptions as touchdowns. He's going to be picked off. How do you explain that? In 1996, Farrakh would lead Washington to its first winning season in five years. You know, we took the guy, everybody said, hey, this guy's a can't miss. Well, it, it didn't work out. We were trying to find a young quarterback. We found a guy in the seventh round ahead of the guy in the first round. That's really what happened at the end of the day. Farrakh left the Redskins after five seasons and had a lengthy career as an NFL journeyman. Heath Schuler would eventually find success in Washington, earning a seat in the House of Representatives for his home state of North Carolina. If you don't have obstacles to overcome, you know, how much do you really appreciate the, uh, the true goals that you've obtained? And now uh, obtaining those goals are not personal anymore. Do you remember where he finished in the Heisman that year? Uh, second. Do you remember who finished first? Charlie Ward. In 1994, Charlie Ward was the reigning Heisman winner. But two issues kept him from being a top pick. First, he was a two-sport athlete, and NFL teams doubted his dedication to football. Second, he didn't fit the prototype for a franchise QB. Ward has joined Army's Pete Dawkins as the only Heisman winners to go undrafted. Dawkins was ignored back in 1959 because of his military commitment. Ward was given the cold shoulder treatment because he refused to make a choice between the NFL and the NBA. My statement was, if the NFL didn't choose me in the first round, I would consider my other options. Uh, I'm not sure how that got to, if I didn't get drafted in the first round, that I wouldn't come and play football, or it made it seem like I was being arrogant. But no one approached, because I wasn't 6'5", 210 guy. What, what is the quarterback at Florida State saying about his basketball? <laughs> it all comes down to where he's drafted. How high he's drafted? Yeah, how high he's drafted. Now, he said, obviously, if he's number one draft pick in football, that's where he's going to go. Anything less than that, still up in the air. Uh, I don't know. The Kansas City Chiefs call to see if I would be interested in being a backup for Joe Montana. 
Lamar Hunt was enamored with him, and we all were. He was a great athlete, and we got down sixth, seventh round, and we were considering doing that. Would have been an interesting pick. That's a fine prospect. Yeah. But I couldn't guarantee them that I would show up for training camp if I'd have gotten drafted in the NBA in the first round. With the 26th pick in the 1994 NBA draft, the New York Knicks select Charlie Ward from Florida State University. Charlie Ward played for 12 seasons in the NBA, mostly in a reserve role. But the question remains, with players like Russell Wilson and Robert Griffin changing the perception of what it takes to be a franchise quarterback, was Ward just ahead of his time? I see myself as one of those guys if I had an opportunity to play in the NFL. You still hoop at all? No. Not anymore. Ironically, Ward now makes a living with the sport that spurned him two decades ago. Uh, well, I'm currently coaching, you know, high school football. I got a quarterback. Okay. That's, uh, he has potential. Okay. Good. There you go. So soft-spoken, man. You, you're a legend, this guy. Uh, uh, legend. Yes, this guy's a legend. Seven quarterbacks were taken on the second day of the draft instead of Charlie Ward. Jay Walker had a 100% completion percentage in his career. He was two for two. Jim Miller started 26 games for the Bears and led them to a 13 and three record in 2001. Glenn Foley threw for 415 yards and three touchdowns against Steve Young in San Francisco, but in a losing effort. One, two, three, River. Woo! Let me hear that quarterback shiver. Big buck, big play. Ooh, Lord, what you got to say? Pure entertainment. To date, Marshall Falk and Larry Allen are the only two Hall of Fame players to come out of the 1994 draft. But there was no shortage of Hall of Fame talkers. He ain't want to catch that. He ain't want to catch it. He ain't want to catch it. He ain't want to catch it. Just like you, you don't want to catch it. <laughs> you ain't tackled nobody yet. Scrubs. Don't quote me on that now. Coincidentally, many of the head talkers from that draft became the talking heads who cover the draft today. They can keep building this offensive line and protect that quarterback. If you wanted to draft the best talker available, you would have had to think long and hard about who you wanted to take first. You had Kurt Warner in that draft. You had Trent Dilfer. You had Rodney Harrison. You had Willie McGinnis. You had Marshall Falk. I mean, that's a Mount Rushmore of gab. Football really started to grow in the, the, you know, the early to mid-90s and watching guys like... Tom Jackson. I was like, I want to do this. I want to interview players and be around the game that I love. But when it comes to the draft, at least one former player turned broadcaster doesn't get all the fuss. If I didn't work it, I wouldn't watch it. I, my boss framed me out. I just, I'm being honest. If there's anything I am on TV that's honest, I wouldn't watch it. Because I'm a player and I know how many of those guys that we're going to talk about so much are going to end up on the streets. And how many guys you don't even hear draft day are going to be the guys that win you a game in the fourth quarter with four minutes left. And the fact that the audience sits there and consumes it all, I, I struggle with it. And I do it. But it's not even close to an exact science. A case in point is Jamal Anderson, one of 1994's big talkers at a seventh round steal for the Atlanta Falcons. Oh, I like it. Now you know I got you that last play. Number one, I was a tweener, a fullback tailback. So it was like, what position is he going to play? And look at Jamal Anderson bust through the line, a fine run for the big guy. And number two, I messed my ankle up at the end of my college career. So that might have got me more than anything else. Up to the time he got hurt, up to the time he got hurt, he was a roaring Jesse, and he got hurt. But he's got the power coupled with all the other things. I thought Kansas City was going to be the team that came down to me and another guy, Donnell Bennett from University of Miami and uh, they selected Bennett. I did not ever forget that. Anderson didn't forget the other 22 either. I'm almost positive there were 23 running backs selected before me. Eric Red had a couple good years. Ah, Chuck Levy, Arizona. Charlie Garner was outstanding. Mario Bates, nice guy, but that didn't work out. 
Donnell Bennett, Jeff Cothred, Tony Vincent. Wow. He ended up coming to Atlanta, and he was one of my backups. At the end of the day, I think there's only one guy on here who put up better numbers than me. Actually, two. But who's counting? While most of the others faded into obscurity, Anderson created the Dirty Bird and soared into the Super Bowl. Touchdown Falcons! Jamal Anderson out of the backfield, and here is the Dirty Bird dance. To be a big part of that coming from where I came from, I mean, I wanted everybody who didn't draft me to pay. The best thing ever happened to Kansas City Chiefs was me going to the NFC. I can assure you that Kansas City Chiefs. All right, now, in regard to the free agent scenario, uh, it may be a shot in the dark, but if there is a priority, a high priority guy here, you need to be there on the doorstep. As part of the league's new collective bargaining agreement, the draft shrunk to seven rounds in 1994, creating another pool of free agents among undrafted rookies. A lot of teams after round seven all ran for the phones to call the guys and try and sign free agents, the guys you would have drafted in rounds eight, nine, 10. Let them know that, you know, if you're not drafted, we're really interested in you. If we can't squeeze you on board, we're gonna come knocking on your door. But what we're trying to do is create a situation where we're saying, our guys there, we've got the contract, this is the deal, sign it and let's go. That part of the draft was really more frantic than the regular draft because every team is planning the same thing. So in other words, we're going we're gonna to have to eliminate the guys that we think are going to get drafted and have the best chance of being someplace where, where there will be a legitimate free agent. So what I have to do is look, follow the draft if I can, if I can get ESPN too on, yeah. <laughs> whatever. There were a lot of guys that would have been drafted that weren't, but in a seven round draft, they fell through the cracks. 1994 remains the best undrafted class in NFL history, including Kurt Warner, Jeff Garcia, DeMarco Farr, Tony Richardson, and Rod Smith, the Broncos' all-time leader in receptions, yards, and touchdowns. In the end zone, Rod Smith with a Denver touchdown. I probably one of those guys they looked at and said he's too slow and, and, and really kind of didn't even give me a chance. But I didn't get drafted, and I'm still upset by that. I don't think you ever get over, you know, your name not being called on draft day. When you get a sack in the NFL and you start doing a sack dance and pointing to people, you are pointing out every face from the combine, from the bowl games, all those coaches and scouts, everyone that missed on you. That's the people you're yelling at. You just don't know where Terrell Davis is going to come from, where Tom Brady is going to come from where Jamal Anderson is gonna come from. You like to think you have some great idea about the top picks, but sometimes Ryan Leaf happens, you know? The uh, seventh pick in the draft was uh, traded by the Rams to San Francisco. No draft pick in NFL history has been traded more than the seventh pick in the 94 draft. Number seven started with the Falcons, who traded it to the Colts for quarterback Jeff George. The Colts packaged the pick with a third round selection to move up to the Rams slot at number five to select Trev Alberts. Los Angeles traded the pick to the 49ers and kept trading down, netting multiple draft picks. San Francisco, the final resting spot of the seventh overall pick, used it to select defensive tackle Bryant Young. Young started every game as a rookie and contributed to the 49ers Super Bowl victory. The San Francisco 49ers are the first team to win five Super Bowl championships. Bryant Young was just the beginning of San Francisco's draft success in 1994. The 49ers started four rookies on their Super Bowl winning team. The 94 draft was huge for us. Bryant Young was one of the great 49ers of all time. Lee Waddle was a great contributor. Doug Bryan was a contributor. So guys contributed right away. That was a big deal for us because we needed every ounce of whatever we could possibly get. Floyd dives into the end zone. Touchdown, 49ers. The 94 draft helped San Francisco win Super Bowl 29. The same draft aided the Rams in winning Super Bowl 34, starting with the selection of their eventual all-time leading receiver. 
the broadcast is getting ready to transfer from ESPN to ESPN2. And I hear Chris Berman saying, you know, goodbye to everybody who's been watching. For those of you that have watched us on ESPN, we thank you for joining us. But in the background, you have the guy doing the announcement of the guys who are being picked. The Indianapolis Colts second round choice is Eric Malum, center from California. And I hear this guy go uh, with the 33rd pick, the Los Angeles Rams select Isaac Bruce. Yes, he is, and the type of Green guy that can wreak some havoc. It'll be interesting to see how he fits, because you know Bill Parcells will unleash him. There are. And I was like, did he call my name? To my agent. He was like, mm, no, I don't think he called you. I think he called Isaac Davis from Arkansas. Many, many other. And of course, in Tampa Bay. I'm just watching now. I'm watching the screen, because the screen goes current selection. Los Angeles Rams select Isaac Bruce, and I just went bonkers in his house. I was like, I told you they called me. Isaac Bruce wasn't the only starter from the Rams Super Bowl team selected in 94. The Rams drafted free safety Keith Lyle in the third round and landed defensive tackle DeMarco Farr as an undrafted free agent. The second pick of 94, Marshall Falk, was acquired by a trade from Indianapolis in 99. Really, all those guys were drafted in 94? Yeah. Um, Seriously? Yeah. Finally, the man many consider to be the greatest undrafted free agent of all time, Kurt Warner, was also from the class of 94. <laughs> Kurt Warner was one of them. Uh, what, what are your he was 94? I didn't know he was 94. Man, hi, what are you? Love you, coach. I love you, too. Thanks for the team. <laughs> Woo. Warner began his NFL journey as an undrafted free agent in Packers camp. He had a little trouble being comfortable with our system, and that, uh, that eventually got him cut. That was just stupidity on our part. The future two-time NFL MVP earned his shot in the NFL through a stint in the Arena League and a tour in NFL Europe. Now, Kurt did get a lot better once he went to the Arena League and once he got some role league experience, and I think getting cut from Green Bay lit a fire in him. But he did some good stuff in college too, and somebody should have been able to see the traits that he had that you could develop this. Quarterback doesn't look bad, Jimmy. What? He doesn't look too bad. Quarterback? No, he looks pretty good. If there is one thing that Warner's story proved, it is that the NFL draft can be a crapshoot. Well, it tells me some guys just copy off other guys' reports. I mean, some of the scouts. When you miss a guy like DeMarco, when you miss a guy like Kurt Warner, I mean, it's, someone should lose their job. Crapshoot or not, the draft of 94 was just the beginning of the NFL's rise to a year-round sport. It was becoming a bigger event nationally. It wasn't just about ESPN putting on the two days of the draft. Talk radio was talking about it incessantly. The newspapers were covering it like a major event. The magazines were covering it like a major event. You were hearing trade rumors. The Cowboys, they hoped they would have a deal with the Rams trading Alvin Harper in Dallas, moving into that five spot. When that stuff starts to foment and build up, you know that you are riding a pretty good wave, and that wave has not crested. I mean, it has just gone higher and higher and higher. here at the NFL Draft with the Marriott Marquee. There is very little downtime for NFL fans the way this thing has played out. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends.